Good day, and welcome back to Ellensburg Amplifier Repair and Service. So I'm back to you with this 8000D amplifier by Power Acoustics. This is the BAMF 1.8000D amplifier. And we are going to continue our journey into rebuilding this amplifier with different components. So what I have is I have the 90 and 20 Ds for the output section and I've got some 1405s for the power supply. I will leave a description down below. Uh, for these parts here and I also brought in uh, new plastic drivers the 2113s just in case this 2113 here did not survive the journey and from the other video um, if you remember we have a shorted output transistor here which brought me into this quest of, uh, let's just have fun with this amplifier. So we got to remove this board from the heat sink. And I kind of also wanted to give you guys an idea of the kind of mass that this board has. So there's many reasons why I chose to... Uh, use this board as a demonstration example of of making modifications to it. So just to give you an idea, uh, this weighs the heat sink weighs with the board, of course, but the mass, the majority of the mass is the heat sink weighs eleven pounds. So it really does have some good uh, mass to it to be able to dissipate the heat that this is going to produce. That's why I decided to go with some different transistors to uh, test on this board. This is my own board. I own this board. Uh, again, this I purchased this off of Wish, knowing that it was uh, damaged, broken, not functional. So I knew it was coming in as a non-functional amplifier. But for the $70, I said, what the heck. I am always looking um, at manufacturers' architecture, uh, how they design their boards, how they put them together, what parts did they use, and where manufacturers are, I don't want to say taking shortcuts, but using parts that could have better ratings. Uh, you know, a lot of engineers will bark at you, oh, they're, they're built to be the best at what they use. But... Sometimes you got to ask yourself, do they really build them with absolute efficiency in mind? Me personally, I don't believe so. I think if a manufacturer can save a dollar, they're going to save a dollar. Regardless of the end user, uh, what, what they, I don't know, I don't want to say what they think, but so if you burn an amplifier up and you send it in for warranty repair and they say you use the amplifier outside of specifications well do you think they're going to repair your amplifier under warranty no they're going to really lead you into purchasing a new amplifier so you got to kind of think of these kind of things from a business standpoint.
if we had to warranty repair everything we sold we or everything the manufacturer sold they really wouldn't sell any new equipment they'd have to keep repairing the equipment that burns up so i just believe that does not have efficiency in mind and definitely does not have the end user in mind it has the business in mind I've spoke with uh, people from Power Acoustic directly and you know they're 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 decent people I don't know if they exactly know exactly what they're talking about when you talk to them on the phone but it's kind of like talking with the people at Maxonics we'll just kind of base our own opinions on you know how these guys talk uh, these guys they don't like independent repair shops they don't like to see their stuff getting repaired and put back on the road i i believe that to be a fact that's just my opinion of course we again all have our own opinions but let's get this board out of this heat sink here let me find all the screws that's holding this thing down. Looks like we might have one screw that is stripped in the hole. So you have to excuse my reach around the camera as I try to work this screw. There it goes. Up out of the board and I like to keep all my board screws separate from my trim screws again this thermal paste once you get it on black surfaces especially this aluminum uh, powder coated stuff it's an absolute nightmare to get that stuff back off so I try to keep the thermal paste away from all the anodized aluminum and we're just going to remove this board I've never pulled one of these parts so I don't know if I have all the screws looks like I do and then if we got one clip here that's going to be going up to the base Little trick with these is if you get your fine tip tweezers and you slide it under right underneath the edge and you rock it up and down it adds its own leverage to pull that thing out and you do have let's see here we do have our thermistor just underneath here I'll make sure they don't use a screw to hold that down and then I'm just going to remove this board And then hopefully they have discharge resistors across those capacitors if they're charged. Again, you got to be, please be careful with the high voltages of these amplifiers. So there's the board. And again, that heat sink has got some good mass to it. It'll make for some good experimentations. Pull my thermal strips off, get those thermal strips out of the way, get my paper towel to clean up my fingers so I don't get thermal paste everywhere. And let me get a little closer here on the camera. All right, there's the board for you. So what we'll do is we will remove all the output transistors. We'll leave the rectifiers in. These are uh, 20 D30s. So uh, those are absolutely fine to leave in place and we will remove all the power supply transistors and put in our new transistors so let me uh, get my Hakko 808 going here we'll heat it up and we will get these out be uh, right back with you
All right, let's uh, let's get this Taco 808 going here, and we will get these transistors out. It's all warmed up and ready to go. Let me get something under the board here so my transistors are a little higher off my mat here. All right. Taco 808 is warmed up, ready to go, cleaned up. Anyone that's a Hako 808 owner knows that these need to be maintained all the time. Clean out the diaphragms, the valves, keep everything clean and these things will run forever. So, let's get these things out. And just like that, all the power supply transistors and the output transistors have been removed. So let me clean up my mess here and uh, we'll continue on. I'll be right back with you. All right, I am back with you guys. I have uh, cleaned up and tested all the transistors, the power supply and the output transistors, and I had one bad 260N on the output. So that one transistor, of course, brings down the whole board. But as you see here, I got the meter out and I have it out for a reason. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, test the resistance uh, between all the pads of the output section. You want to do this before putting in your uh, output transistors only due to the fact that there could be a problem uh, since there was a shorted transistor there could be a problem somewhere in the controls in the output section of that class DIC and you know with these being as expensive as they are you don't want to burn them up uh, before even getting the amplifier on the test bench so what we're going to do is we're going to check the resistance of the pads of the uh, output transistors so you'll see here we have 2.5k and now remember this is the one that was shorted so we have 2.5k between the the gate and source so if you come over to this side between the gate and source, you're going to see you have, I think it's 10, yep, 10K on the uh, gate and source of that side. So you, you can think of it as you got your high side and low side. Um, I'll show you the, the uh, IC schematic here in just a second, the uh, data sheet I mean. So you, these three here are one side, these three are the other side. And uh, so this tells me that I need to dig into this a little further before I go and install my output transistors. So between the gate and drain, I have 7K. Between the gate and drain, I have eh, 15K and rising. So I'm going to go a little bit further back in this circuit, which is gonna if you lead back is gonna dump you directly back to the 2113 uh, class D drive I see here and let me uh, let me get you a data sheet here so this is the pinout of the of the IC let me get you to the functional block here this is the internal functions of the IC so you have a low side drive and a high side drive and what we're going to be looking at is the resistance between the VCC and the low side and the VS and the high side on the IC here so pins one and three is your low side and let me get back to the screen here. So pins one and three is the low side. And I'm just going to check and see. So if you check between pins one and three of the IC, you're gonna see we have a one ohm 
short on that IC. So that tells us that this IC has a short between pin 1 and 3. So if you were to install these expensive output transistors without checking your resistance values or even diode check your gates to your source, you could destroy the output transistors. So always try to make sure, keep in mind, that when something shorts, it usually takes something out behind it. So I will have to remove this IC and replace this IC, and then uh, we will move forward to fixing this amplifier board. I'm just going to do a quick diode check on the uh, on the diode here because. You'll see here that we have a diode that's associated with the VCC. So I just want to make sure that it did not damage the diode uh, on VCC there. And we're looking good. So you only got what? Uh, yeah, 0.458 on your forward voltage there. So that diode is good. So I don't suspect there's any damage to the VCC section of that IC. So let me uh, get this set up to remove that IC. We'll get that off the board. We'll get a new one on there and then check again after you replace the IC to make sure all shorts have been cleared. So stay tuned. Stay with me. We'll be right back. All right, I'm back with you. So let's proceed to remove this IC. Um, I've done this a few times in other videos explaining how I remove ICs. Amtec Flux. I use some Amtec Flux. I use some SRA uh, fast chip low melt. I'm just going to put some flux here on the IC. I'm going to get my little stick here of my SRA low melt solder and it's really just a simple process get a little bit of flux here on the iron and I just spread that low melt right along the pins of the IC and I just go across the pins it doesn't take very much of this low melt at all to mix in with the uh, pins of the IC. So the primary goal is just to mix that lead free with the low melt with the Am Amtec flux there. This flux works really good with uh, lead free solder. I, I have found it works good. I don't think the manufacturer uh, I think it states that it's not compatible with lead free. I can't remember. I'd have to go back and look at the uh, specification of the uh, of the flux, but it does. It mixes really nice with it. And there it goes. Once it starts floating around, then you can just pick it right up. And that is the removal. Of the IC and then I just use my uh, solder braid here to uh, clean up the pads and this braid just soaks up that low melt quick so it just takes a second to run across the pads here Make sure none of the pads are bridged. And just like that. And then I always uh, take my Q-tip, my IPA, clean the board up. And 
as most of you that watch my channel I'm pretty big into keeping things clean just like that and you can see all the pads there are flat looking good let me get you a little close up there of the pads so there it is the removal of the IC so now let me uh, get you switched back over to a different camera view here and we will uh, we will check for shorts again of uh, the gate drain source pads just to make sure everything is clear so remember how we had a one ohm short between one and three and now we don't it's open there so we have 10k now uh, between the gate and source of the channel that had a short and we have 10k on the high side so rem again remember uh, pin one was your low side so this is your low side here this is your high side here so shorts have been cleared um, it's good to install a new 2113 on the board and then we will install uh, the power supply transistors. I will leave the outputs out for now, but I'll install the power supply transistors. We'll put some power to this and see how well this uh, builds the rail voltage first before I install the output transistors. So again, stay with me. I'll be right back with you. All right, welcome back. Um, Let's go ahead and get these power supply transistors soldered into place. And I like to use my Paco 808, of course, to solder in these TO247 transistors. So what I do is I just solder the first leg of each transistor. Uh, that allows me to do adjustments to the transistors without applying too much heat uh, to move them around. So I've seen uh, some people, they'll solder all three legs and then they'll have to try to adjust the transistor for the height. And it's just, it's just so much easier just to solder one leg, uh, get your transistor, yep, solder one leg, get your transistor in place, and then solder all three legs. So just like that. So what I do is I look for the height of each leg uh, compared to the originals that I pulled out. So you have a good idea of the height of the original transistor that came out versus the height of the new transistor that's got to go in. So then from here what I do is I just adjust the height just to match making sure that the leg is adequately soldered to the pads because you gotta remember a ton of current is going to flow through this so you want to make sure that everything is soldered it literally just takes a second to solder these all in place and you you'll know it soldered well when you see the solder flow down in through the via to the top side of that transistor. So that's all the power supply transistors soldered in place. And then from here, what we'll do is we will get some uh, power applied to the power supply. And then what we'll do is we'll see how these uh, IRP 1405s react with the drive circuit. Hopefully, they respond well to the drive circuit. I'm going to cross my fingers. I don't think there's going to be too many issues. 
on these transistors here. Looks like I got a few that are just a little crooked that I may have to straighten out, but I will wait until I know for sure that the uh, drive circuit works with these transistors. So uh, let me get my power set up and like to get the scope set up and we will we'll see uh, how this responds. I'll be right back with you again. All right, so I got the scope grounded. Let me get the scope pulled up for you guys here. So there you go. So there's a scope in the upper left-hand corner, as usual. So I've got the 12 volts hooked up here. This is my 2 amp current limited power supply, as usual. We have all the 1405s installed. And let's see what the drive signal is going to look like here. There we go. So we have an excellent drive signal, 29.4 kilohertz. Let me check for heat, make sure none of my power supply transistors are heating up. Not at all. Stone cold, those are. Looking good. Let me just verify that they're all functioning as intended here. Looks great. So do we, what do we have here for rail voltage? Let me increase my rail voltage. I have no idea what the uh, rail voltage is of this particular amplifier. So we're going to check here. So it looks like we're 70 volts positive and 70 volts negative. Does that correspond with our rail capacitors uh our rail capacitors are 100 volt capacitors so yep that is looking absolutely promising so excuse me so the next thing does this ic require the transistors in place it will for i do believe for the high side but i should see switching let me think here a second i should see switching for the low side if i'm assuming correctly here so it does look like i need to either introduce a signal or i have to have the transistors in place let me uh let me get a signal on the input here real quick just to make sure that it's just not uh, needing an input signal to get that ic rolling and let's check this out again here. Oh, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. So yes, it does require an input uh, to get the uh, drive IC going. So there it is. I, I, I had an idea that I didn't need transistors in for the, to see the low side. Which is really common um, on a lot of the Class D amplifiers is you can at least see the half of the health of your output without the transistors uh, by using an input signal. So by seeing that low side drive, and let me make sure I don't have any funny business going on with the high side drive here. Yeah, there's no funny business going on with the high side drive. So that's looking fantastic. You can see those little pulses there. So that's exactly what I'm looking for uh, for this board. So, so far, so good. The power supply transistors. Stone cold. I see absolutely no problem with that. Of course, this is all before doing any load testing. Components, nothing's getting hot. I will take a quick thermal image of the board just to make sure I don't have any issues with the voltage regulators uh, on the board. 
since I don't know the circumstance of the failure of this board. It only had one shorted output transistor, so I don't suspect a lot of damage uh, on this board. That's why I picked it up, because uh, it was cheap. And I do have, I'm just using that TG167 uh, imaging camera here. So I'm just going to fire it back up. I don't have any LEDs. It's, I think the LEDs must be on the heat sink uh, for your indicators. And let me see. Make sure I don't have any hot spots. Yep, so just the some uh, voltage regulation there, which is going to be absolutely normal to see heat on your voltage regulators. Everything on this board is running just absolutely relatively cool. There is no heat whatsoever. So we're looking good. Even the drive IC is looking fantastic. So I'm feeling pretty confident that we can install the output transistors on this. And let's see if, uh, if these transistors will handle the uh, timing and dead time of this uh, drive circuit. So stay tuned. Let me get these output transistors in and we will uh, fire this thing back up. See you in a second. All right, so here's the new transistors. So as you can see, I only have one set. So if there's any form of failure uh, of these on the output, I'm going to have to go back to using the, uh, the 260Ns. So I'm hoping, these were pretty expensive, I'm hoping these work. These are a hair slower than the 260N, so uh, the I think the rise time on these uh, were, about, were about double the rise time of the 260Ns. So fingers are crossed, this is the closest thing I could really find. Uh, when it comes to the uh, higher current, and this can handle wattage-wise, dissipation-wise, it can handle substantially more than the 260N. Um, so I'm really hoping that these succeed. So, fingers crossed, let's get right to this. And one more thing. Before you guys put your transistors in, check your rail voltage. So a, a, just a good practice to get into is to make sure that your rail voltage is discharged before installing your transistors because that will destroy your transistor so you want to make sure that those transistors are safe by having discharged rails so i just have to find a place here to discharge the rails which i think i'm going to do it at the rectifiers and uh, we'll make this safe to put them in and for all you that don't know how i discharge my rails is i have a big 2 ohm wire wound ceramic 250 watt resistor that I use to discharge rails which as you can see discharges those rails without incident All right, so we have the output transistors installed. I've got, um, you'll see that I have channel one and channel two uh, hooked up to the gates of the output. Because remember, what I'm looking for is the, uh, since these are a little slower transistors, I'm I need to make sure that I'm not switching both the high and low side on at the same time. So we need to make sure that our dead times don't overlap, our rise and fall times don't overlap. So this is where 
either it's going to work, it'll halfway work, or it won't work. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to fire it up here and see what happens with this output. All right, welcome back. So, I was just, uh, I was missing one thing. These things uh, require a load uh, for the output section to work. So, back to where I was at here. So, we're going to be testing these transistors. So, this is my uh, 2 ohm, uh, my 2 ohm 250 watt load resistor so I just want to see what kind of switching signal we get here even if we even get a switching signal and we do so we do get a switching signal so I'm going to take my input signal off just to see if we can get a signal here with that, that without the modulation involved so now it looks like you do have to have the input signal So we are getting modulation. So this one's going to be kind of hard to test. Let me uh, check the output of this and see, do we have a clean sine wave? Yes, we do have our clean sine wave. So the sine wave is clean. The transistors are getting just slightly warm. So this one's going to be kind of hard to do. So I, I should mount this back in the heat sink. Um, and see what temper what kind of temperature rise i have on these transistors i'm just trying to find the best way to test this without damaging those output transistors so we do have again we do have a clean output uh drive on this So 50 hertz. Yep, exactly. So we're looking pretty good. I like I like the how clean this is. So I'm not seeing too many potential issues here, but I do need to get this in a heat sink uh, to see how well these are playing with each other here. So let me get this put together and I'll be right back with you. All right, I've got the board put back in place. I've got all the heat sink transistor tie downs in place. I've got a two ohm load attached, a 50 hertz input signal. So let's go ahead and fire this thing up. And we will be watching the scope there. And there's our signal, 51 hertz. Just clear as can be. Again, this is at a 2 ohm load. And my load resistor, it's getting a little warm, so that it's definitely got some, some power going through it. So there we go. The transistors were successful. And now we just got to do some load testing to test the longevity and durability of the transistors. And of course the transistors are tied down so there's no heat coming from it. So I'm going to call that a successful transition. So again we use the 90 and 20 D's in the output and we use the IRFP1405s for the power supply. 
which should allow a significant uh, amount of headroom for these transistors. So again, I thank you guys for watching. If you like this kind of content, please like and subscribe. You will find all the information down below uh, where you can possibly purchase this amplifier off my website at some unbelievable prices. I have just a pile of amplifiers here that uh, I would love to uh, get back into vehicles. So, have any questions, concerns, or comments, please leave them down below. And we will catch you again on the next one.